There's way too much about the grid to explain in a two-minute video, but if you want to just know some of the very basics, here's enough to get your feet wet. Okay, so a power plant turns on, it burns something, which makes steam, which turns a turbine, which cranks out power. And it runs at a constant rate of, let's say, 400 megawatts. If it does that for an hour, you've got 400 megawatt hours. To get that power to houses, you need transmission lines. But because there's resistance in transmission lines, some of that electricity is lost. And because power companies don't like to waste massive amounts of the product they're trying to sell, they transmit at higher voltage because that means they make more money in the end. But that's why you see all these around, transformers. You see big banks of them at electrical substations where a transmission line comes into a town, and you see smaller versions on power poles. The big ones will serve a whole town, and the little ones will serve a neighborhood, or even an individual home. What they do is lower, or step down, the voltage from transmission levels that would fry all of your local power lines to distribution levels that would fry all of your appliances, and finally to household voltage, which lets you microwave your pot pie. So here's the trick. The power being generated has to match the power used at all times. If there's too much power pushed into the lines, they would basically start to melt. If you see too much power being sucked out, the voltage would drop to the point where we'd see rolling blackouts. That means when we all get home from work and start microwaving our pot pies, power plants have to adjust constantly to meet the demand. That sounds like a bunch of hocus pocus, right? As in, how do they know I switched on the light? There's a couple of ways that it works. First is that it's pretty easy to measure voltage. You can do it yourself with a $10 voltmeter from a hardware store. So as the microwave carousel starts spinning, the voltage will begin to drop, and power plants can be designed to adjust automatically. Also, the lines are always a little bit overcharged. That extra power is generally just lost as heat as the electrons vibrate around and push their way through the resistance in the lines. That little bit of extra gets gobbled up for those really minor changes, like if one house switches on its AC. And finally, experienced grid operators can look at the past and say, well, given the weather we're expecting and the amount of daylight we have, in the past we've needed X number of megawatts at 2 p.m., so we'll line up that many power plants to turn on. But there's always a little bit of uncertainty. They never know exactly who's going to turn on their TV when, and so the grid has some backup reserves built in. First, the folks in charge will order some power plants to spin at partial power. So if something happens, like, say, if a power plant goes offline for some reason, the grid operator can call on those guys to turn up the boilers and spin up to full power. That's called a spinning reserve. The grid can also call on fast start generators, plants which run on jet fuel and can go from dead cold to full power in 10 minutes. Those are non-spinning reserves, and some of them are super expensive to run. For a long time, this is how the grid has worked. Power plants reacting to changes in demand, with a margin of error built in ready for those changes. But increasingly, things on the grid are starting to go two ways. For example, there are companies who are helping big consumers install technology that will help them automatically conserve energy when the grid is stressed out. This is known as demand response, and it's cheaper than paying those expensive-to-run jet fuel generators. Grid operators can pay big energy customers like supermarkets to do things like turn off half their freezers for five minutes at a time, or tell every superstore in New England to turn off every fifth high-powered fluorescent lamp in their store. The companies like it because they can get paid to conserve, and electricity consumers like it because it means their bill will be cheaper overall. At the same time, there's more solar and wind coming on, which introduces more unpredictability. And grid operators say they'll need more flexibility, more reserves, more customers who are willing to let the grid temporarily control their freezers or lights or whatever, so that if the wind cuts out suddenly or a big cloud goes over a two megawatt field of solar panels, the hospital next door doesn't suddenly have to switch to emergency generators. That is, of course, until somebody figures out how to build some sort of big, cheap battery that you can install anywhere, which, who knows, might not be as far off as we think. Electric cars, cheap solar panels, and efforts to curb climate change are all increasingly part of everyday reality. So, now that you know the basics, you're ready to watch as the grid as we know it changes dramatically in the next few decades. <laughs>